challenge is to invent the equivalent of logic and rhetoric by means of which electric le learners may interact with these patterns in order to thrive in the life world. Thank you. Very good. Excellent. That's a difficult thing to do. You do it yeah. I apologize cool. for my voice. Uh, I was running. <laughs> <It's> perfectly <laughs> Greek. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, that's cool. It's really a delight to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Mark has a great tolerance for my <coughs> account of the world, so I appreciate that. Uh, and you do have with you there the Sharpie and the cocktail napkin, and you know what's coming, but we have to, we have to set it up first. So the title is uh, Wugga Mugga Electricity, and uh, the lecture is devoted to Richard Feynman, who's a uh, book there you see, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, uh, his autobiography. Richard Feynman <coughs> won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1965, in quantum electrodynamics, and he taught at Caltech, but he was an undergrad at MIT. So I decided I would tell this little story uh, because uh, undergrad MIT requires some humanities. He didn't understand why this was necessary, but he was in science. But he took he had to take something, so he signed up for a philosophy course. He said throughout the semester professors lecturing. And to him it sounded like wugga mugga mugga wugga. Mugga wugga mugga wugga mugga wugga mugga wugga all the semester long mugga wugga. Trying to take notes. Other kids seemed to understand. So towards the end of the semester he noticed his peers were starting to get really excited. Mugga wugga mugga wugga what's going on? What's going on? And somebody explained to him he's about to give the assignment for the final paper. So find the pace super attention he hears Wugga mugga wugga mugga, stream of consciousness, mugga wugga mugga wugga. He actually heard stream of consciousness. And he wrote that down and that was what he did his final paper on and got a B plus. <laughs> so today I'm thinking, you know, wugga mugga electricity. So if you come away with the electricity, at least you probably got 90% of what you need. <laughs> but of course this is design school, so it's not like, you know, physics or something. Um, but I'm also today, for today, or at least for this seminar, I like to think that we are at the Massachusetts Institute of Apparatus. Because the apparatus is, you know, technology, yes, technology is one part of the apparatus, but the other two parts are institution formation, the, in the institution in which the operating uh, procedures and languages are invented for that technology. And also, uh, the third part, identity formation, new identities, new behaviors are also invented. Uh, so rhetorics, behaviors are invented just as much as technology, and they're invented in quite different ways. So the apparatus is technology with institution and identity formation. Uh, we're going to put this account in a narrative, and you are in a narrative. In fact, narrative is one of the most fundamental modes of comprehension, and this whole seminar is a narrative. And we know how narratives are structured, that uh, they have this midpoint, this turning point. And we're at the midpoint, Mark tells me, more or less midpoint of the semester. Uh, so my lecture arrives to be the turning point. Uh, it's a kind of, uh, the term here is miniaturization, mise on a beam, it's the French way of putting it, you got mise en scène, mise on a beam, putting in the abyss, like the play within a play in Hamlet. So I'm the, I'm the play within a play, going to model, this lecture is going to model uh, the whole seminar, the whole semester, I, I claim. Uh, and in fact, it's going to model your entire education. So. <laughs> but uh, so there are protagonists, right? There's a plot in the narrative. This protagonist has still to become the hero. Here's a call. There's a disturbance in the world. And let's say the disturbance in the world is the arrival of electricity or some other disaster. And to become a hero, uh, 
the protagonist passes through three tests or has to answer three questions. And the first test is competence, which just require this modality of being able to be able. The second test is performance, where the object of value is, is this confrontation and the object of value is one. And then the third test called sanction or evaluation, where the object of value becomes a measure of a just world. So there are these three tests and these three questions that structure all possible experience. Now, this thing I want to emphasize. It's not like, well, there's those three tests, and then there's some other three tests somewhere else. So the claim of this lecture is, in fact, you might not need any other education after today, right? This, because we're going to just like give the whole thing right here, these three questions. And they certainly organize all education in any case. But my, my purpose today is to introduce you to these three questions, these three tests, and to uh, set up the capacity to answer these questions, which you and you only can answer. But in fact, you already know these questions, you already know these answers, because they are the structure of every narrative ever told. Every story ever told is organized around these three questions. And the idea is, the reason why we keep telling the same stories and using the same questions to structure our narratives is to indicate to you uh, that you, these questions are posed to you and you have to answer them uh, for yourself. So first test, first question is competence to be able to acquire this modality. And we're gonna do a little exercise of confidence. This is the famous napkin sketch exercise. And I know it's hokey and stupid and maybe it's a mythology, but actually it's very real. Uh, so I was looking into this, and the American Institute of Architecture Students, for example, sponsored, um, they, they uh, invited the star architects around the world to submit a napkin sketch, and uh, they put them on auction. They raised a huge amount of money for scholarships. There are many legends of napkin sketches. Here we have uh, Daniel Liebeskin's uh, napkin sketch of the Michael Leach in crystal, whatever that is, but this is a napkin sketch. That was very famous actually, in the history. Um, and but the prototype we're going to talk about is, um, give it a little anecdote, set this up. So Frank Gehry, uh, is in Kobe, Japan. He's already Frank Geary, the famous Frank Geary by this time. And businessmen had invited him to Kobe, uh, and they have dinner and everything. And of course, what I was, I'm always interested in, so they have dinner and they have cocktails. And like, the problem here is like, where's the cocktails? Well, you have the napkins. They always tell you about the napkins. What about the cocktails that I think are probably an important part of the story you don't hear much about. But in any case, Kobe, Japan, and, uh, and after dinner, the businessmen invite, really demand from Gary that he, you know, on, the, on the napkin, draw them a concept, draw the sketch, draw the concept for this building. Now, I'm assuming it's going to be a building, it's going to be designed, but it can be, be anything. Uh, and I'm putting you in that situation, I'm demanding right now, you have one minute, Take, you have your Sharpie, you have your cocktail napkin, it may be unfolded if you like, but please, in the next minute, draw the concept or you know, no, you know, money's no object. We need a concept sketch of, of what's the what's the design idea for a building. So, right? pause one minute. Make your design concept concept sketch. No time to think. One was just sketch.
paid a lot of money for those pins, so they better work. <laughs> Did a fiddle with it, but time's a waste. So here is this was a big enough. I think that's Geary's up in the upper left-hand corner. So the one in the upper left-hand corner is Geary's. This, these are the sketches that were made by the, the star architects contributed to the auction. Geary's was valued at up to five thousand dollars. I don't know what they sold for, but in any case, just to say. Uh, <coughs> So what happened to Geary was, just to finish the story, so he does a sketch, and of course, by this time he does his fish. I mean, this is Geary's gesture. Uh, and the Japanese businessman loved it. He said, this is fabulous. Send us, you know, have your team work up the whole design. So he goes back to LA or whatever and works up the whole design. Sends them all this stuff. They said, where's the fish? Didn't look like a fish. They wanted, literally, they wanted the fish. They didn't want like a building that was like fish-like anything or you know so he refused to no, know you're stupid that's it they said well okay fine uh, we're gonna take that napkin sketch we're gonna hire a local guy and he's gonna build us the fish and this now Gary was like no way you're not building my fish so he ended up building the stupid fish <laughs> this is what it looks like you can go to Kobe and go in there yeah. <laughs> okay so but I want to I want to pack this a little bit because you now have the first right there with you you have experienced one of the fundamental secrets of reality. I say secret and it's esoteric. <clears throat> uh, keeping in mind that, you know, if you read about these ancient rituals where the meaning of life was revealed to you in an initiation ceremony, a lot of cocktails and stuff beforehand, of course, uh, they end up showing you an ear of corn. So you're like, Whoa, an ear of corn, dude, you know, it's like, it's an ear of corn. But like, it's real, it's true. Uh, <clears throat> But so, we call this the magic tool in narrative. Um, and you know, you meet an ogre in the woods, an old guy, kind of bald, kind of rickety, and you know, and he gives you the magic tool that enables an ordinary person to encounter, confront, and overcome a monstrous obstacle. And that and that magic tool is just human capability. It's like the ogre, the magic tool reveals to the ordinary protagonist their own capabilities. But their capabilities are in a condition of privation, what Aristotle calls stereosis, meaning they're potential, but they're not active yet. And it takes this journey, it takes this narrative to bring them into being. So we're going to unpack this a little bit uh, because the magic tool is a minimum system. Deleuze, Deleuze call it the, an abstract machine. Um, and I'm going to give you a description of a number of these abstract machines. And again, what I'm saying is this abstract machine we're looking at here, this minimum system, this is it. This is near corn. This is true. It's not like, well, tomorrow if we go over to Harvard, there'll be a different abstract machine. No. This is the abstract machine. This is the abstract machine in Stanford. It's the abstract machine in London, in Beijing, everywhere. So the abstract machine was a minimum system. We, there we have on the left, we got the, the, the Asian, Chinese, or Japanese ink painting, which, you know, are... We're, we're similar to it, so you've got you know the sharpie holder, the ink in the holder, the paper. When the Asian is the brush, the ink, the paper, and the gesture. And those four forces are a minimum system. Every <coughs> game played with the ball is a ritual reenacting this minimum system. So the original one was polo. Polo is a sacred game originally. 
uh, to celebrate this truth. Uh, but um, a good example of this sacredness of this system uh, is the Mesoamerican peoples, Aztecs, Mayans, the Popol Vuh, you know, is their sacred book. The Popol Vuh is about this game, uh, Tlachi, that Mesoamericans played, which is sort of a soccer basketball in which it's possible to die. <laughs> that was how they interfaced, gods and humans interfaced through this Tlachi game. But golf is how we do it. American presidents all play golf. Some play way too much golf. But so this game is uh, the hole, the ball, the club, and the stroke. Minimum system. You take any one of those away, you don't have a game. You can add stuff, and then it's more, it's elaborate, but uh, you know, and, and we celebrate this in all of our professional sports. We just got the Red Sox coming along here. Um, <clears throat> So the ancients wanted everybody to remember the system, so the card games were invented to, uh, as a mnemonic system to recall and to guide, give guidance in practicing this abstract machine, this minimum system. Um, and the best one that really fills it out, because it's been all commented on, is uh, the minor arcana of the tarot but we have our, you know, our suits of cards, hearts, diamonds, clubs, and spades are, are this, this tarot system. Uh, <clears throat> let's say cups is hearts. That's the hole associated with water, the element of water, concerned with love, uh, sensibility, intuition. Uh, pinnacles, diamonds, is the ball, element of earth, uh, and related to practical material service concerns. Wands is clubs. The element of fire, romance, creativity, and glory. And then spades or swords is the stroke, is air, intellect, communication, travel. And this is an oracle system. And an oracle system is, uh, for pre-modern peoples, and even today, works if you ever got a question you can ask Tarot. Uh, works is an, ex an existential positioning system. So, Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology is concerned with GPS, global positioning. If you need to hit somebody with a drone strike, you know, you know where they are. Uh, but, th but for the larger apparatus question is existential positioning system. Uh, this larger question we're going to talk more about. Uh, but what I want to especially call attention to is something that people miss. It's a four-part system, minimum system, is the stroke is crucial. That, that's the play. So the system is dynamic. It's in movement. It's a relational system, not a thing. It's not a substance. It's a relational system. And we are talking about trace. Derrida calls trace. The movement of the system is what Derrida calls trace. And I want to remind you that the word electricity is a portmanteau made of electricity and Derrida's trace, so electricity, modeled on the creation of literacy. Uh, but so Derrida calls difference, trace, these are synonyms, is the opening up of this space within when the system is underway in, the, in its vortex movement. Uh, so I, I like the baseball strike zone because the baseball strike zone exists only within the terms of the play. There's not a strike zone like bring the did you bring the strike zone? You know, like a I shipped in an Amazon, I got a deal, I got two strike zones for the price of one. No, the strike zone appears in the rules of the game. And there it is. And it's this zone. And then the temporality of that zone is the timing of the strike is Kairos, the moment of opportunity. Ball is thrown 100 miles an hour, and there's some people that actually can hit it. The ball comes through that zone. You strike at the right time, trace. Uh, I kind of like, and I also like, so the sliding tile is the simplest example. And I love the sliding tile puzzle because it reminds me of Cambridge traffic. <laughs> and also like, so Mark and I are trying to get to the restaurant. We're, we're at position 15, and all the others have to get to that space. There's like one space in the intersection, one intersection in Cambridge, of all of Cambridge. You know, all the traffic is trying to move through that space. But believe me, if that space isn't there, 
you got to move out of Boston. You're just going to have to leave, you know, because you need that space. And that's what we're going to be talking about. That's the open. Heidegger talks a lot about the open. We're going to be talking about this. That space right there is the open. Now, an allegory for this, some of you may know Crazy Cat comic, uh, George Harriman, strand of comics from 1913 to 1944, Coconino County in Arizona. It's got these characters, Crazy Cat, you got Ignaz the Mouse, is compelled to throw a brick and hit Crazy in the head. Crazy is gender fluid, actually loves Ignaz, receives the blow as a sign of love. This is actually a mother child relationship, I think. Officer Pup is moderating the scene, trying to prevent this from happening, but of course he can't. And the diagram of the Crazy Cat minimum system game is. Minet Tom's Butterfly Catastrophe, which is a diagram there. Four inputs, one output. The four inputs are Crazy, Ignatz, Officer Pup, and the Brick. That's, that's the system. Now that little fuzzy diagram up there, Gregory Bateson drew this system. And he called it the universal motor. So the universal motor, the minimum motor, now we're getting more into MIT territory. Uh, is it's got a fuel reservoir, flywheel, cylinder, and a governor. It manages this energy. And energy is a crucial word here, flow of energy. So the transistor's got these four, got this minimum system. Source, drain, gate, charge to manage the flow of electricity. And then the big diagram there, Jacques Lacan's diagram, here we're really getting to the core of something I want to talk about and call attention to because this universal motor is in us. It is the life-death drive of desire. Um, and this is Lacan's diagram of it. Uh, object, aim, thrust, and source. And this is the Crazy Cat game. It's the universal motor. Uh, and what's crucial about human beings and the life dynamic is that the aim and the goal cannot inherently coincide, and they do not. And so this is the brick. That is, there's some force that prevents us from achieving wholeness. That is nirvana, or a lot of sacred techniques to try to achieve it. But the goal is never and cannot be arranged. So just, I mean, I just made a chart here, you know, this is, this is way extendable, but these, you know, I've got Aristotle's causes over there left, you know, structure, case, prepositions, and in, uh, in grammar. But I mean, it just repeats throughout every system. And I'm saying every system. This is why this is the means out of being. This is why I'm summing up in one lecture, everything is possible to know and do. <laughs> so, all right, might be some exceptions. Maybe they know something at Caltech, I don't know. But I'm lecturing here. Uh, but anyway, just so you can make your chart. Uh, now Heidegger theorizes this. One of the reasons I suggest you read Origin of the Work of Art, because Heidegger introduces something that I think's really got legs, really, really got, got potential. And that is, he takes his German word Riss, and Derrida done a ton with this too, from, from Heidegger. Um, and Riss is one of these, you know, one of the reasons why Heidegger claimed that the only language that was more philosophical than, than German was Greek, and they had to admit Greek because they invented philosophy, okay, so, you know, and usually when there are Greeks in the audience, they always snicker when I say some Greek word, you know, it's like, <laughs> uh, but Riss, so, so, on the one hand, there's a set of words with Riss that are, mean rift, tear, cleft, breach. Another set of words with Riss mean sketch, design, and outline. So we say rift design. So what we're talking about today is rift design. And electrate designers need to be rift designers. Uh, now Heidegger lectured about this uh, a number of times. Of course, writes about an original work of art. Uh, but he was specifically talking about Albert Durer, is where he got this idea. And he was referring to Durer's drawing there as the young hair, it's called. Um, and Durer said, art lies hidden within nature. One 
who can wrest it from her has it. So there's this resting, this rift design relationship. Uh, for Heidegger, this is a relationship between earth and world. So you have earth, which resists. Earth is matter. Uh, it is potential, and it resists. And then there's world. World is formation. The word information is actually matter that's been impressed in form. So form. And they're in a relationship with polemos. It's ignats and crazy. There's a struggle between earth and world. Uh, and the classical philosophical terminology here is potential is earth. Dunamis. And that's the state you're in at the beginning of the narrative. You're in a state of potential, but you're not real yet. State of potential, stereosis, privation. And then there's energeia, which is actualization. World forms. Uh, the world opens up. And what opens up the world is this motor, this access, accessing of this universal motor or of this abstract machine. Uh, Heidegger's example in the essay, Origin of Work of Art, he does talk about the famous painting by Van Gogh of the shoes. But his other example, which I think is actually better, uh, is the Greek temple. And the idea is the Greek temple perfectly illustrates this polemos between earth and world, because what the temple makes manifest and brings into appearance is this opening up of world through this act of design in which the roof is lifted up above the floor and sacred space is created by these pillars 50 feet high through the act of design and that sacredness is the open world. And in fact, the pre-Socratic philosophers, I have a whole lecture on Anaximander. Mark keeps trying, wants me to give it, I'm trying to work it in, but Anaximander actually shifts his understanding of the world from morality to literacy on the site of the, of the Ionian temples in the sixth century BC. He writes the first piece of philosophy, one little fragment survives uh, on the site of these temples. And you know, we think, so when we think about the film director who looks with the gestalt of our frame, uh, as we have that image there, that's the open. I want to say more about that. Uh, the last example here is Buckminster Fuller's Tetrahedron. So I want to mention this because uh, Buckminster Fuller articulated the tetrahedron, which is a four-sided triangle, um, as a minimum system. And if you build a building the way he built with his geodesic principles, actually if you build it big enough, it actually floats off the ground. Uh, because it's a tensegrity. Uh, but in any case, a lot more to be said about that, but uh, due to close, discovered it through close packing of spheres. Uh, but what's cool about it is he said, look, the world is not, the dimensions, the X, Y, Z axes of the Cartesian grid and so forth, 3D space, uh, cubic, is that's, that's, that's one step back. The fundamental structure is not cubic X, Y, Z, it's the tetrahedron. And so you replace X, Y, Z axes with the, with the four-dimensional tetrahedron, which includes the three dimensions plus time mass. So it's Einsteinian. But the cool thing is when you're looking through and you're imagining, you're framing your space, you're not, you're not framing in linear depth, you're framing in tetrahedral uh, vortex universal system. So that's something to think about. <clears throat> All right, so that was the uh, close that pause. <laughs> Side detour there, uh, the object of you know the competence uh, and minimum system. To talk now about the second test, second question, which concerns the object of value. So you've got the universal motor; that's your magic tool. We're now going to concern ourselves with the object of value, which is what enables you to run the universal motor. And we're gonna, we're really asking, so where did Frank Geary catch his fish? Because that fish is 
Frank Gehry's object of value. And we're concerned here, as we said, with the narrative of education. And in the conditions that we are in, we're concerned with, uh, with your work, you as the protagonist, uh, and the need to undertake revolutionary science rather than normal science. And MIT just wants you to do normal science, and any school just wants you to do normal science. But we want to push that. Uh, and we're familiar with that terminology from Thomas Kuhn, scientific revolutions, normal science, and revolutionary science. So when disciplines are blocked, and normal science simply won't solve the problems, too many anomalies continue to appear, somebody steps forward and does something original. And the question is, where does that original hypothesis come from? It's no longer that by which the disciplines do their business. And there's an historian of science named Gerald Holden that's extremely influential in my work. Uh, he studied creativity in many cases. And he pointed out that education, that there are three primary dimensions of learning. Yes, those are our three. And he said the disciplines teach two of them very well. They teach the two that are concerned with the verification or the proof of how things are. And the first one is empirical facts, you know, which are theory dependent, we call that theoria. Second one are the analytical operations performed upon those materials, uh, mathematics, logical operations, we call that praxis. But it's the third dimension that's not taught. And that third dimension he called thematic. We can call it poesis. And he said, everybody knows it's there, and any history of creativity will include that third dimension. Uh, but the thematic dimension is where these original ideas come from. And there are, one level is collective, and that is just there are these recurring questions that are, if you like, that are archetypes. Every apparatus asks them, like, well, where does the world come from? Creativity, how does that happen? Um, but then, more importantly, and more relevantly for us in our narrative, uh, are these, uh, the fact that individuals, individuals hold, have a primary intuition about reality. And they have it from the very beginning of their life. It's presupposition. Call it disposition. Supposition. There and again here's where German, you know, has all these Stellen words, or like you're talking about in or in Heidegger's technology, Gestell, Stellen word. Stellen Stell means position, taking a stand. Standpoint, a standpoint. Viewing from and thesis. So thesis is this position. So when you write your master's thesis, you're saying you're developing this standpoint. And are you going to do it from the position of normal science or the position of revolutionary science? Uh, diathesis, state of mind, esthesis, sensory perception, and hypothesis, hypothesis. And hypothesis is an unverifiable intuition that you put in as governor and say, I'm going to see if I can prove that. That's the theme. Heidegger calls disposition Dasein. That is your being in the world, in a situation. And I love these maps. So you got these maps, this arrow. These are little allegories. You are here. You know what Kafka would do with that. He uh, could do a lot of, a lot of that. Uh, but this here at in technological terms is a GPS. You know, like I, this particular one is, uh, is yes, it's place, it's Ponte Vedra Beach uh, between Jacksonville and San Augustine. I go there all the time. Uh, and they don't have a big arrow, though it's there existentially. Um, but that arrow is a rebus. Now, in the origins of writing, the way writing got started is way back. Uh, so with ancient Sumerians, 2800 BC, and they had a word for arrow, it was T, and they had a word for life, T, which was a pun, uh, T, 
teeth. So when they wanted the word, write the abstract word life, they drew an arrow. And that's the way all writing got started. Uh, that, that, that kind of pun. And I like, uh, we got Paul Clay's black arrow there, because remember Paul Clay really got, he really gets electricity, if you like. Heidegger referred to him, importantly. Uh, but when Paul Clay drew, he understood that a line is a vector of a force. And the way he described his drawing lesson was taking a line for a walk. Sometimes you follow the line. You don't tell it where to go. It tells you. But it's a dynamic force. It's a vector. It's a trace. Uh, so we want to think about your existential thesis system or existential position system. Uh, so, so an example, so, so Gerald Holton says, well, I'm going to tell you that I know where original hypotheses come from. Uh, and, and of course, in the study, you can study the careers of people after their careers are over. And this has been done in hundreds of cases. And you can see a pattern in the career of these creative and productive people. Uh, and you can see that in that pattern that these creative people reproduce a certain style of thought. And in fact, the way Holton theorized it is uh, that every person has four or five fundamental images uh, that organize their imaginations. And the understanding is that, again, we're in a condition of potential, stheresis. So your capabilities, when you're born, you have the capability of language. As a human being, you have that capability. And if you're born in Los Angeles, you're gonna, your language is going to be formatted English. If you're born in Beijing, your language is going to be formatted Chinese. So it'll be actualized as Chinese. Uh, well, same for the imagination. You have the capability of an imagination. And then it's formatted. So if you're born in South Georgia, you know, in the early 20th century, your imagination will be formatted that way. Uh, it's going to be idiosyncratic. It's going to be specific to you. This is an extraordinary human resource. That's why Buckminster Fuller said, look, let everybody go to college, go to school, as much school as they wanted, through, get three PhDs, whatever, in whatever field they want. doesn't matter because he said every 100,000 people are going to produce something so amazing, so productive, that it'll pay for everybody else's education. That, that was his philosophy. I, I like that idea. Uh, <clears throat> but in any case, uh, so so what what I find inspiring about Holton is he said, uh, yeah, you can wait till career's over, but also he said we know where that original hypothesis comes from, and it comes from childhood. Uh, so you already your format your your imagination is already formatted by the time you start school, and we'll we'll talk more about that. But Holton's favorite example is Albert Einstein, and that's fine because Einstein is kind of the emblem of genius or something, mythology of genius, whatever. Uh, but Einstein, in his autobiography, he remembered and repeated the story all of his life. He, very, he had a strong memory from early childhood. When he was age four, four or five, his father came back from a business trip and gave him a, a compass. And Albert was just absolutely fascinated with this compass. The needle, no matter how you gyrated the container, the needle stayed pointing the same way. Uh, and the principle of electromagnetism was not understood at that time. And of course, what makes Einstein's story so wonderful is like, well, who did figure out how electromagnetism, what the physics of it? Well, Albert Einstein actually. It's like, I wonder how that works. It's, okay, it's a little too neat. Okay, so because there's, there's some other things that happen. But uh, but the idea though is uh, so we're saying all right, the the, the compass uh, we're saying is Einstein's object of value. Uh, it doesn't cause his imagination, it formats it though. Because it, it crystallizes, it brings it into uh, appearance, makes it appear as an image. This is the key of thought that his imagination thinks with. So image and theme, or you know, our rhetorical terms are vehicle and tenor. So the compass needles the vehicle. And the tenor, the way Holton phrased it, was the invariant principle. 
So he's got the compass needle, the invariant principle, and then the way you activate, actualize in Ergea, the object of value is when you're up against the problem, this problem in physics, you extract the diagram from your object of value, from your imagination, and map it onto your problem. So invariant principle becomes speed of light in Einstein's theory. Uh, but we want to talk about Frank Gehry. Uh, so Frank Gehry, so, and of course the, the imperative here is think about this for yourself, but so Frank Gehry's story, his memory that persists, told in his biography, is, you know, he's living with his grandparents in Canada. They're immigrants, Jewish immigrants from Poland. And they have a tradition of going Thursday to market, buying a live fish, putting it in a tub, and overnight, and of course, 24 hours later, served for dinner. But Frank loved, he said, hours watching that fish swimming in the bathtub. And there was also a negative charge because as a Jew, he received anti-Semitic slurs sometimes, which is, you smell like a fish. So this is a charged emblem. Uh, Holton calls this an image of wide scope. So you have a wide image, an image of wide scope that uh, that uh, gives your gives you intuitive gives, gives you access to your intuitions, and that fish movement uh, is trace, and it's it's the universal motor, and you see it in the Bilbao Museum, and you see it in the Kobe Fish Restaurant. I have a second example. I love architecture examples because there's such a direct translation from the image to the diagram. So from, you know, from the memory, it's idiosyncratic, personal memory to, uh, to a working hypothesis. Uh, and this is the case of Renzo Piano. So Renzo uh, Piano had memories uh, of his childhood in Genoa, very strong memories. One was uh, walking through the streets and seeing the laundry hung out on the roofs and have his billowing sheets. And the other was going down to the harbor and watching the sailing ships with his father and imagining them as moving buildings. So his vehicle, his image, is the sail of a ship, this ballooning sheet. And his theme, or his tenor, he called it lightness. So that's his invariant principle. It's the force of wind and light creates this experience of lightness man made manifest through the sail. So, uh, so Renzo Piano is at dinner <laughs> in cocktails with Irving Seller, developer, uh, and uh, they're talking about building the Shard, the Shard in central London. Uh, and uh, he asked Piano for a sketch, and Piano drew a gigantic sail, and that's, and that's an image there of used a green felt pen on a cocktail napkin and drew his diagram, drew his gesture. Uh, uh, and Irving Seller, the developer, has that napkin framed in his, in his office, and it is the basic gesture for a 95-story skyscraper, tallest building in the UK. Uh, and the idea was it took the energy, again, energy, captured the energy of the railway, the river there, and that site, put it into that sketch. Uh, <coughs> and, and so the idea is that, um, that this, this image of wide scope is, uh, is the object of value that enables an individual imagination to run the universal motor. That's the way we're translating it. Uh, now how do we get that image of wide scope out of the imagination of a child and into a more philosophical way to, to think about it? I learned, I came to understand this through uh, teaching uh, undergraduates and I was trying to teach this idea of C.S. Peirce's, you know, firstness, secondness, and thirdness. Uh, it's his way of putting it. And the idea is that firstness is this experience Think of it as an aesthetic experience um, for uh, 
when you first notice something in itself, the way a child is just, whoa, you know, an octopus, or anything. Uh, and that's uh, a thesis, that's first, is, uh, Heidegger calls it Galassenheit. Galassenheit, meaning letting beings appear as they are. That's a kind of revelation of the world. Now, another kind of revelation of being is technology. Regarding things as standing reserved to be exploited. Oh, can I make something out of that? Can I sell that to somebody, that kind of standing work? That also reveals being in a certain way. But there's this other way that Heidegger was more interested in, this existential way, we'll say, of letting things appear as they are, letting things be as they are. And this moment of firstness, just regarding the thing, this has already happened to you. It happened to you as a child, early on. And then secondness is just whatever that experience is, putting it into a pattern, seeing it again, there's another one of those. And then thirdness is interpreting it, putting it into a system of meaning. <clears throat> so um, I came to understand this through Japanese uh, folk uh, notion of beauty, which is called wabi-sabi, and you probably went into that before, uh, the classic image of wabi-sabi in the culture is uh, the cherry blossom leaves, blooms falling, not at the peak, but falling, dying on the ground. For us, and certainly here in New England, uh, the autumn leaves create this mood or this feeling of wabi-sabi. <clears throat> the translation is rustic, anything humble and perfect. Um, uh, they love. The poet Basho gave this definition which is if you see a man dressed up for a party, going to a party all dressed up, and this man is old, that's wabi-sabi. Um, so that would be the image. Now the theme, what's the theme of wabi-sabi? And because this is a classic cultural tradition, much discussed in the literature, we know what the theme is. <clears throat> uh, and this theme of wabi-sabi poses three questions and answers them. These are our three questions. Um, and it answers them by means of the uh, Asian wisdom traditions, wisdom religions of Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism. So it gives like these cultural <coughs> answers, metaphysics, morality, and mood. So this is the question, and the idea is that you have to find your own wabi-sabi. That is, you have to find what is your own mood, Heidegger would say, right? Mood is <clears throat> this mode is mode of revealing being. Being reveals itself to us through mood. This is your, the mood of your disposition. You are a certain way. So you're a physicist in, in a joking, satiric way, if you're Richard Feynman, you know. Uh, like you know physics, and you win the Nobel Prize, and you're a clown. So it's that, that's that dispositional part. Uh, and uh, so the questions are, first, how does the universe work? This is a metaphysical question. What is reality like? Now, the wisdom traditions answer that things are devolving toward or evolving from nothingness. Only nothing is permanent. OK, well, then morality, given that that's the way the world is, how should I behave? And notice there's no right answer to this question. How should I behave? Well, the wisdom answer is, be rid of everything unnecessary. Values are intrinsic, not material. And then the third question, well, if that's the way the world is, and I'm supposed to behave that way, how should I feel about it? And again, there's no right answer, but the wisdom tradition says, accept and appreciate what is. Now, so if you're a Japanese monk, you know, man, it can work for you, I don't know. But the, the point is, it's not that there's one answer to this, uh, but that those are the questions and you find the answers for yourself. Uh, and, you know, like, obviously, if you're on the Titanic and sinking, you know, how should I behave? Uh, well, we know in that movie what happens. <laughs> Just go to bed, have some sex, you know, it's like, all right? Seize the day, right? that's another, that's another answer, I don't know. Another tradition. Uh, but every, every folk culture has this, this kind of classic uh, 
uh, to Lorca called it Duende. It's a soul, this life experience uh, that we're asking. We're, and we're saying, what's your personal version of it? Now, what again, this is the Misa being, so I'm emphasizing that these themes that we're addressing and these questions that we're posing, these, this is it. It's not like, oh, well, there's another three questions somewhere else that are completely different from that. No, there are not. <laughs> You can study and you can read a lot and you can get several PhDs and you're going to run across this universal motor everywhere because we are human beings. And this is our potential. These are our capabilities. If we were owls, if we were ferrets, there would be a different something. If we were lizard people. Um, so you see it everywhere in culture and art historians have written about it. I like this example. Um, but uh, by Paul Gauguin, and he's in a situation. He's in Dasein, his circumstances are not good. He's in Tahiti, 1897. Uh, he's in despair, disillusionment, the Tahiti thing wasn't working out. Uh, he's ill, he's in debt. He decides, all right, I'm gonna commit suicide, but first I'm going to paint my last testament and share with the world what I know. And he painted this and he called it, and his title is Our Three Questions. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? And Hal Foster has said, this is the catechism of modernism. And what knocked me out was the first time I came through, went to the Museum of Fine Arts of Boston, this painting is in your museum. I was walking there, I was like, what? I couldn't believe it. It's like, you got to go there, right? This afternoon. Yeah, it's right there. Um, but, uh, but the, so when you look at this painting, on the art historians will tell you, or Gauguin wrote it in his journals, so this painting, the narrative painting, it goes from right to left, and it is a trace, it's the gesture of life from life to death. Uh, that's, so that's trace, that's what it looks like from Gauguin's frame. Um, but this story is everywhere, so again, I like this version, of Judgment of Paris. This, this version of The Judgment of Paris by Peter Paul Rubens, but it's been painted a thousand times. Hubert Damish wrote a whole book on it. Many, many, many versions. Um, but the mythological version is there's the contest for the golden apple. The three goddesses, yeah, <laughs> or three powers. Which one is more desirable? They get the mortal Paris, to be the judge. There's Athena, and she offers wisdom. And there's Hera, and she offers political power. And of course, Aphrodite offers fertility, sexuality, and we know each one of these goddesses bribed the mortal Paris. Aphrodite's bribe was the most beautiful mortal woman, Helen, wife of Menelaus. Unfortunately, Paris and Helen ran off to Troy, and we know Troy Jr. more, so like, that's a lot of negative examples there. Um, but, uh, but that's uh, one version. And, you know, Plato, we, so we've got this chart again, we look, look at how these things stack up, but Plato in the Republic, and he's trying to, in that case, uh, develop a, you know, account of, of an education system for, you know, a new literate uh, utopia. Uh, but he identified our capabilities as reason, will, and appetite. He said, in the body, this is the head, the heart, the viscera, in society. So he, he made that social move. This is very important. He said, in society, it's the rulers, the guardians, and the workers. And they, you, so knowing this, you, you organize yourself accordingly. Um, Aristotle uh, gave us our terminology, theopraxis. Theoria, knowledge is necessity of nature, praxis, ethics and politics that involve human choice, and then poesis, which is technique, craft. Uh, Immanuel Kant updated Aristotle, made a couple of major improvements in the 18th century. This is the beginning of electricity philosophically. Uh, but he wrote three critiques uh, identifying the limits of each of the capabilities. And the critique of pure reason is uh, understanding, that's philosophy addresses. Uh, practical reason is uh, moral freedom. 
Uh, however things might be necessary, moral freedom gives you a choice. History gives us a story of that. And then judgment of imagination, which is art. Now, now Kant's innovation was what up to that time, theory and practice were considered the real capabilities, and poesis was not given equal respect. So Kant promotes poesis, Kant promotes imagination or appetite to equal status as its own capability, and its function was to bring, to bridge the abyss separating science and religion, separating pure and practical reason, and get them to work uh, in relationship, in harmony, and he introduced a new kind of judgment. He introduced a new kind of thought. Uh, or to say it wasn't new because humans have been doing it forever, but he articulated it and made it accessible and manipulable. He called it reflective judgment. Reflective judgment is thinking that is not structured by concepts. In other words, it's thinking that's not literate only. It's not structured by language. And it's organized rather by pure relations of formal qualities, which is to say, it's a universal motor. Universal motor works by reflective judgment. It's, it's a system of relations, minimum system of moral relations. Uh, and you intuit it through the experience of pleasure and pain, through the experience of attraction and repulsion. It's visceral, not logical not moral, visceral. This is the beginning of electricity. And Kant's catechism anticipated Gauguin, because Kant's 18th century, and he said, referring to these three discourses, what can I know? What should I do? What may I hope? So are three questions. And uh, and we want to call attention to the fact that the word for limits in Greek is paris, P-E-R-A-S. We're going to play on that pun to make a rebus of that later. And now we get to the point where people are thinking about their careers. Iris is thinking about where to go to grad school, still more. Uh, and so this may be relevant. Uh, but there is this dimension of applied capability. So, I mean, what I'm saying in some ways esoteric in a sense is like, People seem to forget it or don't know it, but on the other hand, it's everywhere once you know it. Um, but so the three questions are, of course, been studied in applied capability. Uh, I'm going to give two examples, there are many more. So Alan Kay is the creator of graphical user interface, working in the 1970s, Xerox Park, developing personal computing, and of course, he's well read. In, psychology. And so he says, well, human beings have oriented by three capabilities and they have three kinds of input. We need to accommodate these in our computing. And he called it symbolic, which is the keyboard, code, verbal, speech. That's the prosthesis of speaking. Uh, inactive, with the E, uh, action, movement. So that's the mouse, that's the hand. And then imaging, the visual figure, the window and the icon, and that's the eye. So speaking, the hand, the eye, theopraxesis in graphical user interface. Uh, Donald Norman is the other person I want to talk about because he has evolved. He sort of had his Kantian revelation. But Donald Norman, uh, is the director of the design lab at UC San Diego, and in fact, Akshita Sivakumar has worked with Mark, a uh, friend of Iris, who is doing, yeah. doing her PhD. Two, two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, there at UC San Diego. And uh, Donald Norman is, uh, promotes uh, design as a way of thinking. And he says there are these three dimensions reflective, which is intellect, what's useful. Uh, behavioral, effective, which is usable. And he used to stop there. He says, really concerned about usability. That was his original, his original work. You read his older stuff. But then he had this realization with all these studies that said the most usable uh, uh, 
input um, features are those that are attractive. Ah, so you gotta you gotta include appearance. You have to include the visceral. You have to include what's desirable. They go together exactly as Kant said. So the useful and usable are brought together by the beautiful, or you know, the desirable, at least. Um, so we come to the third part. And I have changed slide design unapologetically. <laughs> so, uh, so the third question, the third test uh, concerns measure. So we have the capability, you know, the universal motor uh, competence. We have the object of value, which is we're said now is our image-wide scope, uh, which prepares us. And now, put them to work on behalf of measure, prepare us limit uh, to respond to the disaster that is the call of the narrative that's got us into, into this mess that needs a original design as an answer. And so uh, we say that the apparati, the four apparati, and there are four, paleo, oral, literate, and electrate, going back 50, 60,000, 70,000 years, um, they are a stack. Now Benjamin Bratton has written a wonderful book I recommend called The Stack about the di digital c civilization. He's, he's, this is of course coming differently. Uh, you know, in his stack he says the world we're in right now has six levels. Earth, cloud, city, um, address, interface, and user. So those six stack up. User top, if you like, Earth at the bottom, uh, or whatever hierarchy. Um, and Electricity as a metaphysics of the digital is really concerned with interface and user, so that's where this really becomes relevant. Um, and Bratton himself says that, that the interface for the user is probably going to be one image, or I would say it has to be one wide image, that is the entire total complexity of the world is going to have to pass through this interface of one image for the user, for, for, if we're going to keep the humans involved at all. Uh, or we just throw them out and we have AI, put an AI in there. Uh, but, uh, but the point I want to make here, and this is a crucial part of this whole thing that I want to communicate in terms of the mise en abeam, is that there's this phenomenon of recapitulation, they call it. That's where ontogeny and phylogeny uh, reflect one another. The collective dimension, the individual dimension repeat one another. Uh, the, micro, the macrocosm and the microcosm are fractally homologous. Uh, and so it turns out when you study this history in this context that each apparatus epoch institutionalized or ex extruded as a prosthesis one of the human capabilities. One at a time. So the first one, the Paleolithic, you know, going back 50, 60,000 BC, um, created the family. So the first institution, the oldest institution in the human is the family. It was created there. And in fact, if you like, if you say, well, what did the Paleolithic invent? Well, they invented the human. <laughs> you know, by, they were animals that were playing with things that turned out to be tools, and humanity sort of emerged out of that. So I'll give them credit. But, uh, and I, the reason I have the White House representing Paleolithic here, so don't make a comment on Neanderthals or anything, but uh, but it's the first family. Why do we have a first family? Well, fine, you know, same reason we got a church. Uh, and but the thing, so but now we're so it might get confusing. Three, four. So the four here is uh, the Paleolithic uh, at the individual level and at the at the institutional level is where you get control of the body. So when you're born, born into a family, and you're totally helpless, you got control of nothing. And within the family, and within you know a few years, you're weaned from the breast, you stand and walk, you learn to speak, toilet train, and you're gendered. 
this like give give the kid a PhD. You know, it's always like you're ready for you got a PhD in the visceral. Now I'm gonna start you know preschool. Uh, so we want to you know we want to keep that in mind. And of course, culturally or at the macro level, I mean, hunter gatherers of survival. They open up the caves. Hand eye of a stone tool. They actually got control. The first machine is the throat. So humans are very fortunate. We have our larynx is up here. We're not apes down here. So they got the the first zero one is you know consonants and vowels. Open and close your throat. Now you got a language you can talk. Uh, and the line of depiction in the caves, plasmatic line, major invention. Uh, so, but here's the thing I want to emphasize. So we'll say, all right, the Paleolithic as an apparatus gives us the body, individually and collectively. So we've got the body, got to have the body first. Got it under control. Uh, and what happens in getting under control, I guess I'm going to emphasize this a little more, is right there that the imagination, the visceral imagination created, because we know that that's where desire begins. Is the infant has needs as a body, and we know that in the relationship between the caregiver, the mother and the child, that there's a demand created, not only for milk, but for love, let's say, and that, and that demand can never be satisfied, and so the, the tension between need and demand creates desire. That's the energy force we're going to talk about more. But just to see how the open works, so next um, apparatus begins is orality. And uh, 10,000 BC or so, you know, agriculture, empire. Uh, and a new causality, here's the key in the metaphysics, a new causality is introduced and it opens a new dimension. This is the open we want to talk about. This is the rest. <coughs> uh, it's not there already. Human beings in their earth world polemos open this new world uh, of spirit beyond physical life. You know, we have our uh, more modern versions, you know, the religions of the book, you know, give us our, our metaphysics for it. But so this is why when Jesus is facing Pontius Pilate in a trial, uh, you know, Pontius Pilate, you know, uh, as, uh, you know, in, in the, the temporal realm, you know, the, the political realm feels threatened by this person, Jesus. And Jesus says, no, you know, render unto Caesar what Caesar is. My world is another world. This is spiritual world. It's not this world at all. Don't worry about it. I've got this other, this other kingdom. And it's right. He opened this other dimension. Uh, in the Catholic faith, uh, Mary's womb is Korah. Open. This is the open uh, we're talking about metaphysically. This new dimension and the church. And we have the Sistine ceiling there. The church is the architectural building of that womb. Mary's womb. Uh, it's an opening in the world of a new dimension, and the core value of that dimension uh, is a new behavior, and this is the measure. So the institutional formation of the apparatus introduces a metaphysical reality which guides the behavior of the entire civilization. That behavior is what's right and what's wrong. This is what concerns an oral metaphysics apparatus. Uh, and we're familiar with that in the Ten Commandments. Um, and that's, you know, and of course the powers that be. So if, if you're believing that, that the divine is the cause of your reality, then you develop behavior, you develop institutional practices to influence that power. And of course there you get sacrifice, ritual, liturgies, prayer, uh, and so forth to, to manipulate that power. Totally rational, since that's, you know, that's your metaphysics. Uh, the next apparatus that uh, forms is literacy. A thousand or so BC in the West, earlier than that elsewhere. Uh, and again, introduces a completely new institution, school. Plato founds the academy in Athens. 387 BC, complete new institution in an oral religious, you know, civilization. Uh, and, and the thing I'm emphasizing is that he's opening a new dimension as a new account of cause. Not, not the gods, 
uh, a completely new metaphysics, and the Greeks, pre-Socratics, had discovered what they called phusis, translate Latin natura. And it's a form of power, it's a reality that comes out of itself. This is the mystery, like, it's not caused by men, it's not caused by gods, it comes out of itself. Like, a seed you plant in an acorn becomes an oak. It doesn't become a goat, and you can't influence to, to become gold or whatever. It's like an acorn's going to be an oak. Fuses. Self-caused. It introduced a new measure, a new behavior called science. We still worship it here at MIT and at my school and every school. Uh, we are in the institution of apparatus of, of literacy here in any university. But I've got Galileo representing that here. Because again, Galileo was a famous trial, right? The church now is in power. And uh, they're saying, your account, Galileo's saying, I can prove this is a completely new behavior. What? I can prove. I can prove that the earth goes around the sun. <coughs> Everyone laughed. The smartest people in the world were present, the church fathers. They laughed. They thought it was the funniest thing they'd ever heard. Earth going around the sun. Where is such a thing? It's always a good sign when people laugh at you, so Mark, don't worry, you know, it's, it's okay. Um, you know, your day will come. Uh, they laughed. But Galileo's defense was he said, look, this reality of nature that I'm pointing out to you with my telescope is not, doesn't concern your spirit. Your spirit is fine, not, no conflict at all. Go ahead, you know, do your thing. I'm, you know, just going to look at the stars here. Uh, so, and we're going to talk, we're going to get the last dimension there in a moment, uh, electricity. But the thing we want to emphasize here is this prosthetic relationship between individual human capabilities and the institution formations of the apparatus. Each uh, epoch, in turn, uh, extending into this collective form, this human potential, and actualizing it in institutional form, and creating a measure, each one. So. Morality, right and wrong, literacy, true and false. Uh, and here's the dilemma, though. In the human individual person and in the collective history is polemos. These powers are at war with one another. So science and religion are at war with one another. And now the corporation coming in as institution of, of electricity, I'll talk about in a minute, is, is, is a third war. So war of civilizations, jihad versus the world, uh, and within the individual human being, I know what's right, I will, something else, uh, and I desire yet a third thing, so there's this kind of pulling and tugging. And that pull and tug that you feel as being alive is chase, is the universal motor. So, electricity, let's spend a moment on that. So, what is electricity? What is electrate apparatus that, you know, and we're saying, here's the short answer. So, electricity as an apparatus, as a metaphysics, is the prosthesis of human appetite. And this is a tough part to deal with. Um, so, Walter Ong influenced me a lot, uh, grammatologist, and he said that the, his, he didn't have a term for it, so he called, well, the civilization that's developing under, within the technologies of, of electricity, he said is secondary orality. It was like, right, it's orality that's recorded, so he was thinking about it. But as I came to realize I needed to include the paleo as an apparatus, going back into that older historical period, uh, is we really should call electricity secondary paleo because it is a mise-en-machine of the visceral. The, as we say, the visceral was first brought under control in the Paleolithic, and certainly in the family, uh, in the body. So, uh, so what electricity does is take that viscerality of the preschool body and enable it, uh, augment it. Uh, and let's, let's unpack that a little more. So electricity, begins to emerge out of literacy. This is this weird Hegelian thing of thesis, synthesis, thesis, and to this synthesis, so each apparatus begins to emerge within uh, the previous 
apparatus. So electricity begins to emerge in the 17th century as science finally separates from the church uh, and takes up its materialist metaphysics in full swing. Uh, and the technology part of that, symbolically we say Watt's steam engine 1781 is the, like, is the machine that kicks off electricity because it's credited with the origins of the Anthropocene, which is to say when human activity through our machines began to actually uh, transform the planet itself, giving us a disaster of climate change we're facing now. In the political realm, it's the colonial period, and the institutional invention here, because remember we're Massachusetts Institute of the Apparatus, so we're concerned with institution formation as well. The institution formation of electricity is the corporation. And the first corporation was invented in 1600. Actually invented tw twice, two identical institutions in a way, but it's the East India Company, one in England and one in the Dutch. Uh, and they were rivals competition for, as the name says, the East India Company. They both wanted pepper. They both wanted spice, especially pepper from India, uh, and the corporation was created to, uh, to deliver that pepper to Europe. Pepper, of course, an ancient commodity, tremendously valuable throughout history. Everybody wants it. And, and the invention is the limited liability company. So up till that time, uh, the economic arrangements of exchange were done by contract. But the thing with a contract, you can break it, you can get your money back. The investments <coughs> that were needed to develop uh, trade, global trade in the colonies was enormous. You needed a huge amount of capital. And, uh, and this, the solution was a limited liability company, so the investors put their money into the company and they can't get it back. But then there was created the stock market and said, well, you, okay, you can't get your investment back, you can sell that investment to somebody else. So that kind of solved that problem. And the promise of, of profits was <coughs> enormous. Enormous, and and in fact, it was delivered. So you know, trading ships are very expensive. Like the Portuguese were the first to get there, uh, open the sea route, the Indian back to Europe, uh, and they were losing three out of four ships. Was four went out, one came back, and it was a huge, huge loss. So, but you got this investment. So, um, so there's that economic investment, and the, the, the key point here that to say is that the corporation is the prosthesis of human appetite. Uh, and, uh, you know, they say uh, that everything that uh, develops technologically or, or materially is first appears in metaphysics. So I've got this image here uh, from thing to thing. So the Greeks are, are credited with inventing the thing as the concept, I mean, an individual entity you can define and pick out and isolate GPS of it or whatever. Uh, <coughs> so the dictionary is full of concepts. Uh, and, uh, and the ultimate closure of Western metaphysics in literate terms is now you have Walmart full of things, so, so from, from the good uh, to goods. Uh, <coughs> but this, this, this fundamental insight that we want to work with is that, uh, is that the corporation is uh, created to deliver uh, goods to our appetites. So the corporation is not concerned with true and false. Corporation is not concerned with right and wrong. And you can see why Kant says we got to get these things working together. Because the corporation really said, you know, the corporation should do the right thing. No, it shouldn't. By law, it doesn't have to. And it's concerned with attraction and repulsion uh, feeding human desire. So, like I've studied the Enron Corporation a lot for another project. And Enron is a good example because Enron starts as a natural gas company, develops into a, a general energy <coughs> company, of course, completely corrupt and fraudulent disastrous company. Um, <clears throat> but so the Industrial Revolution is uh, central to uh, you know, technology uh, of electricity, getting together with the institution of the corporation, and they invent the commodity. The commodity form is part of the, in the invention of, of electricity and the innovations of, of money that go with it. And <clears throat> we've got this uh, wonderful <coughs> excuse me, saying uh, Walter Benjamin said when he's talking about the commodity and how it addresses attraction and repulsion, human desire. And Benjamin says, Walter Benjamin says, why is advertising so superior to critique? 
because it's not what the moving red neon sign says, but it's reflection in the asphalt. Uh, and so this, uh, this idea of, of reflective judgment, working with uh, these, these uh, relationships of, of intrinsic qualities, uh, have this enormous appeal, and these appeal specifically to desire, specifically to, uh, to fantasy. Uh, and uh, so this is the, the sort of uh, effect of, of electricity is the greatest conversion in, in humanity uh, comparable to pagan Rome converting to Christianity is, is, uh, is Christian Europe converting to uh, consumerism. So consumerism is a huge revolution in human behavior. Uh, as we know, the Industrial Revolution produced an enormous uh, wealth and abundance of goods. The problem is people wouldn't buy them because they had an ascetic, you know, self-sacrificing, save for the future kind of mentality. And they got converted to consumerism. How? And the answer is, uh, the, part of the invention of the, of the commodity is separating uh, use value from exchange value. So you, uh, because what the advertisers realized they were selling was not the steak, is not the use, but the sizzle, meaning this kind of fantasy about happiness. In fact, the shorthand version of what every sale is selling is promise of happiness. Of course, it's a promise that can't be uh, fulfilled. So here's the challenge of Electricity, and here's why we need original design. <coughs> this is the, the threat uh, and the challenge of the disaster of <coughs> the electrode apparatus and this new dimension that it has opened of desire and fantasy. Is that we actually now have <coughs> industrialized and given uh, uh, institutional access to the very site of the human source of, hum of human imagination, which is to say the visceral motor, the universal motor, uh, which is formed uh, in this relationship of uh, the mother and child. As we know, there's this thing that's called the transitional object. So the first open, opening, Lichtum, Heidegger's sense, is opening the space between the mother and the child. Uh, Winnicott says the transitional object is created there. It's part of the inside, part of the outside. It's this ambiguous space uh, where the child begins to uh, uh, getting starting to get control of his body and starts to uh, develop its own sense of being in the world. Uh, and, and what happens to that uh, infant in those conditions creates its uh, image of wide scope. This creates its, its imagination. Uh, Lacan has another uh, version of this, which he calls uh, that, that open. How did that open? How did that open space that made the sliding tile game possible because that das Ding, which is this lost object uh, that has to be taken out of the game uh, for the game. You have to remove one piece uh, to get the puzzle started, and that piece is the impossible or lost object of love, uh, of desire that then runs the motor from there on. So there's a lot of dissatisfaction that comes from that first object. Uh, but it's that dissatisfaction that's the, the grid of sand and the, and the oyster that creates the pearl of human creativity. So, uh, so being a creative person can be actually kind of rough, the, the, the polemos that we're talking about. Um, but that's, the, that's the, the measure. Now, here's the, uh, the saving grace. So right now, a lot of people think we're headed for a really bad time. You know, the matrix syndrome, uh, as, uh, as, the, as we industrialize our imagination. The threat is that by industrializing the imagination, by giving direct access to human desire to the commodity form and the corporate power through you know, all of our digital uh, reflective judgment technologies uh, uh, that are so, so uh, powerfully attractive, um, is that, uh, that we will actually kill human imagination. So, Aha, but, and we know Heidegger, origin of the work of art, um, Heidegger referring to Hudelin says, but uh, where danger is grows also the saving power. 
And this happens in every apparatus, but it has to happen. And that is the invention of the metaphysics that is appropriate to the technological, technological conditions of the commodity form, the corporation as an institution of desire. Uh, and it is invented in Paris. And this, so this is pun, actually Basha would say, uh, you know, you learn about Paris from Paris, as you learn about uh, P-E-R-A-S limits from Paris, P-A-R-A-S. Not Paris of Troy, no, no, don't take his lesson, but the Paris of 19th century France. Uh, and so this is, the, this is the importance of the avant-garde, and some people miss, if you don't understand the apparatus role of the avant-garde, then, then you, know, you may not know what to do with the avant-garde, but avant-garde is an example of RIS. It is a rift design. So what happens in Paris, we've seen it before, is obviously we know French Revolution, the bourgeoisie comes into power at the end of the 18th century. Uh, bourgeoisie are, of course, uh, finance capitalists uh, and corporations. But within bourgeois Paris, Benjamin called Paris capital of the 19th century, because this place called Bohemia opens in Paris, specifically in Montmartre district on the outskirts of Paris. Um, and uh, the artists begin to gather there. And it, it's um, precisely uh, a red light district, a district of vice, district of, of human attractions and repulsions uh, of the body. Uh, and these cabarets form specifically, especially after 1880, Le Chat Noir, Le Pain Gilles, so where all these artists that we read about and, and so forth begin to gather from all around the world. Uh, and in these cabarets, they started to invent these new forms, these revolutionary forms of uh, working with art and literally filling out what reflective judgment means, which is to say they discover in these forms pure art, meaning pure creativity, uh, exploring these formal relationships of, these, of this minimum system uh, in these Paris cabarets culminating ultimately in World War I, of course, the cabaret scene moves to Zurich, neutral Switzerland, where Dada is invented. And Dadaism is a shorthand for the metaphysics of electricity. Uh, so this cabaret scene is to um, electricity what the academy in Athens and the school is to literacy. That is the site, it opens a new space uh, within the literate society. Uh, and there invents this alternative metaphysics, another reality uh, uh, specifically. And what they learn to do in the avant-garde is to operate what Cezanne called the little sensations. So, uh, as we know, Cezanne is a prototype for this. He uh, discards all the old ways of creating illusions of reality through mimesis, and instead develops a specific new way of creating the experience of three dimensions on a two-dimensional surface, a fundamental formal problem of visual arts, by uh, working with the way the human eye works, uh, which is, say, warm colors uh, advance and cool colors recede. And so he creates, he actually addresses the physiological uh, workings of the body, the little sensations, to create this aesthetic effect. Now the most common industrially exploited example of little sensations is what's called the phi phenomenon in cinema, which is to say when you project a still image, still images at 24 frames per second, it creates an illusion of, of movement. That's, that's a really just an implied example of, of a little sensation. But the key here is that the value, a new value is created in this electrode apparatus, a new measure, uh, which is um, the, not right or wrong, not true or false, but this uh, visceral aesthetic experience of intensity, vividness, participation in experience. This, so experienced designers actually address this. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've got this, you know, most common example of, of this autotropic effect is, is Proust's involuntary memory. I mean, all the philosophers, when you read about this, they all turn to Proust for the example. He, you know, as an adult, he, at his grandmother's, he bites into a 
tea biscuit to Madeline dipped in tea and his entire memory of his childhood floods back to him uh, catalytically. So we say electricity is, is a catalyst, it's not an analyst. You don't analyze, you, you catalyze, you trigger. And we're talking here about all autotropic phenomena, which is to say how the body is affected from the outside, whether that's by roller coasters, drugs, pepper, uh, movies, love, uh, solving a problem with geometry. I mean, anything that on the outside that stimulates automatically, as you can't help it. If you're a human being and you run the 24 frames a second, you're going to see movement. If you're a human being uh, and uh, you know somebody's got bread cooking you're in, in the oven, you walk in the house, you're going to buy it. <laughs> You'll say, people think. Um, but uh, so this so this idea of these smart environments I'm trying to represent smart environments here are are really acting like troops uh, Bruce Madeline biscuit when you walk into a smart environment is trying to uh, to address your uh, your visceral intelligence uh, and so we say well where is the built environment of this new electro metaphysics uh, and in fact and this is again uh, helps helps to have some clarification there's a direct development from the cabaret. Voltaire to Disneyland. There's to say, um, Disney World theme parks in general, Las Vegas casinos, shopping malls, are the built uh, realization of electricity as a metaphysics, uh, developing, expanding out the fantasy dimension of visceral experience of attraction and repulsion, just in the same way that MIT is building out the metaphysics of, of science and literacy, just as the cathedrals of the churches are building out the metaphysics of right and wrong and the oral apparatus. And for that matter, we could go back to the, to the caves uh, and the magical rituals there of the paleo. Uh, and this is, this is crucial because what's happened in the technologies created by digital light speed I mean, Paul Virilio, a theorist like that, tells us that our dimensions have collapsed at light speed conditions. We have total surveillance of feedback loops, instant feedback loops, reiterating and iterating uh, at speed of light. And he says, there is no here anymore. And this is, you know, when we think about you are here as being the metaphysical arrow of life, the implications of that are that there better then be some alternative to that. He says there is only now. And, uh, and the metaphysical implication is, well, it's fine because we have, through electricity, built our, we are building out uh, an environment, a dwelling of, of the virtual, which, in fact, opens up a new dimension of human experience, whether or not it doesn't rely upon GPS, but relies upon existential positioning. So this is the conclusion. So what's your role? And I'm counting, see, I'm counting on your idiosyncratic weirdness as a child that you try to not, you know, let anybody know about. That's actually might be, and I can tell you this, if you do succeed in the world and make a contribution as valuable, all the historians are going to want to know about what was your childhood like? They're going to be looking for your image in wide scope, so you might as well be looking for it yourself and use it uh, to, to create something. Uh, but I want to give you this word heuretics, a logical invention in which you actually ask this question, these three questions we've been talking about today, and you, when you answer these questions for yourself, you'll discover what you believe and what you sincerely feel to be what's great and what's good and what's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, Original uh, hypotheses only. <laughs> so what do you think about those sketches you made? I mean, like, there's like, can, can Kobe Japan, can you build a restaurant out of that, or how'd that go? What do you want to comment on that? Man, there's a lot to unpack in that. Yeah. I mean, there is a lot to unpack in that. You have, you have, each time you've, um, you're sort of, it's like one of your books, like, was it so Rodenti said you, you read a normal book, it's like squeezing a sponge and it, it leaks in <laughs> directions. Uh, you, you once told me how you write, and you said you um, you have a space like this and, you, and, and you're reading several texts that can, concurrently. Right. And so you'll reduce each book to 60 pages of notes, then you go around the circle.